limits now. There's nothing I should turn my head away from in ignorance and say, no, nah, that's too far-fetched. Question everything. Especially my cultural, my religious, my educational beliefs, all the belief systems that have been ingrained on me had to be questioned. Needless to say, making sense of reality seemed a dauntingly impossible task, considering everything I thought I knew didn't make sense anymore. So, where would I begin? Where, where do I start? How was I going to find this so-called truth about anything if everything appears to be a lie? You know, where, where do I start? I quickly realized that truth has no friends or enemies. Truth does not belong to any one culture, race, nation, religion. Truth just is. The sun just is. Life just is. It doesn't belong to any sect or group or subculture or any of that. Regardless of whether I believe it or not, regardless of whether it fits in my box, I also realize that the truth is quite often confused with belief. So what's the difference? Well, belief for me is determined by one accepting something based on someone else's opinion or experience, second-hand information. So that's a belief. So I've not experienced it myself, but someone has told me that this is the reality. Someone had shown me that this is a reality that I have not witnessed with my own senses, so I choose to believe it. So that's not truth. That is a belief. Regardless of how compelling what they're showing you is, it's still a belief because you've not witnessed it or experienced it firsthand yourself, right? And truth is determined by accepting something based on your own personal first-hand observations, experiences, using your own faculties and senses. That is truth. The truth is I'm standing here because you can see me standing here. If someone's at home watching the internet and they're told I'm standing here, I might not actually be standing here, as you saw from the earlier videos today, CGI and all that. It may appear that I am, but I might not be. But you know it's the truth because you're here witnessing it and experiencing it. So that's truth. Right. Of course, mainstream science and popular consensus will often tell us to ignore our everyday observable experiences of reality. They will dictate that our common senses do not always make sense and so should not always be trusted and sometimes even ignored. They will tell us that the logical thing to do is to accept and believe without question everything we are taught and shown by way of television, books, culture, religion, the educational system, because it is what is popular, or it is what everyone else conforms to, or it is what science dictates, etc., etc. Now, of course, I'm not saying everything we are told and shown in religion and education is always a lie. Of course not. That's going too far the other way. What I am saying is, if what I'm being asked to believe does not make sense, is illogical, or does not correlate with my own personal everyday experience of reality, then I should unashamedly question it without shame. I shouldn't be embarrassed to question it because I don't know, right? Which led me to my next question. Where on earth do I even begin with this topic? Where would I find this so-called truth using my own natural observable um, senses. Well, nature. Nature, of course. Okay? Water, wind, the sun, moon, trees, mountains, vegetation, the skies, the stars, never ever lie. Right? They are what they are. Nature is nature. We can manipulate it or try to manipulate it, but water will always be water. Okay? Right. Even uh, Mr. Albert Einstein himself said, uh, look deep into nature, then you'll understand everything better. Right? Obviously, he's a liar. He's part of the uh, conspiracy and whatever. But, uh, but even he said that. Right? Nowhere, based on that fact, nowhere in the natural, observable world does water stick to the outside of a rotating or spinning object. 
water always seeks to find its level. I can confidently say this because it is what I logically observe with my common senses within my everyday reality. On this one basis and alone, it is impossible for the earth to be a violently spinning ball, for me at least. Far more likely is the fact that the earth is level because that is what water tells me. 33 years of my life, that is what I've observed, that is what I've experienced with my own senses. So why should I go against what I've, my truth, that is my truth, right? Now I'm not going to go into all the arguments of trying to defend the heliocentric Earth model as there are already many independent researchers, as you've seen today, and presenters who've intelligently put forth cases um, for uh, the flat Earth and against the heliocentric model. So that is not quite my forte. There are far better people at doing that. Um, I think many of you, like me, are probably asking the next big questions. Once I realized that the Earth was flat, it didn't take me long to start asking, well, if our Earth isn't a spinning ball hurtling through a vacuum of endless space, and outer space is not likely what we've been taught it is, then what on Earth is it? What shape could our Earth and the universe be? Right? How big are they? What are they? How does it work? How did all of this come about? How much of what we have been officially taught and told is truth, and how much is lies? These questions are daunting and challenging, to say the least, especially considering those of us asking them are a minority with very little resources, information, or support to at least fairly investigate and argue our case, which is what has brought us here to this fantastic um, event hosted by Didi and Gary. Uh, I just want to say thank you. Right, it is also why I'm here presenting my ideas, my theories, my models, and my research. Again, at this point, I want to make it very clear that um, whilst I may not have, uh, I may not be able to factually verify most of what I'm going to share with you today, it's also worth considering that my argument is built on the foundation of certain irrefutable factual geocentric truths truths associated with observable and testable geocentric science, nature, common sense, logic, and my personal everyday experience of reality. You'll also notice as I go along that a lot of my research is very broad um, across a varied spectrum of information. This process, of, this process and method of threading and connecting the dots is known as the science of syncretism. So this is a very old science that we're not taught about anymore. Right? Connecting the dots. Once again, I want to um, reiterate that I'm not here to preach or sell anything. Please don't take my word for it. Okay? I simply want to present an alternative model, theory, and perspective of what our world and universe might be from a geocentric perspective. In a logical way, that at least makes sense, right? <laughs> Having said that, I think it's safe to say modern humans, for all our so-called technological advancements, we have collectively lost something, right? With all this technology, we have lost something. We have lost the ability to use our natural senses, to discern truth, or at least make better informed decisions. We have lost our connection to mother nature, our past ancestors, all of them, in this realm, across the plain, certainly had a better understanding for the importance of having a syncretic, symbiotic relationship with reality and the natural world around us and beyond. We're all stuck on our tablets and technology. We've completely lost track of the real world, nature, what's around us. What are the stars saying? What are the, what, what's the moon saying? What's the sun saying? You know, what are the seasons saying? You know, that is, uh, anyway. Right, our past ancestors seem to have a better moral and intuitive sense of being that we might call spirituality today. The more I syncretically study and look into ancient scriptures and mythologies, the more I begin 
to feel connected with the natural universe. So that's just my journey. In fact, when I really started to research this uh, cosmic egg topic, um, mythologically, I soon began to see a pattern emerging. I noticed that almost all the cultures I was researching described our universe and its creation in great, great detail. But not only that, almost all of them had a very, very similar story from various African tribes to the Americas to Europe and Asia. They all describe a creator of some kind in different forms, but all of them believe that everything was created by something or someone. So that is across the board. They also described our universe as being birthed from some kind of cosmic egg, right? All of them, every single culture, which I'm gonna point out tonight, all talk about the universe starting in an egg, right? And inside this egg, our Earth was said to be flat and motionless, sitting on waters below of some kind, and heavens rotating above us. Again, they all say this, every single one of them, from Africa to Europe, right? There's also a recurring theme of the Earth being vast and having many other worlds, right? This was something that absolutely um, blew the hinges off anything I thought I would come across. I never thought that these ancient cultures would be describing other worlds on Earth. So when I saw this, this rang alarm bells and thought, well, why does no one ever talk about these other worlds that these cultures are talking about? Okay. Uh, they also talk about um, this concept of the center of the world, the central pillar, being at the middle of the earth, sometimes depicted as a tree of life or a sacred mountain in a paradise land or realm, usually associated with being the cradle of humanity and life as we know it. Again, every single culture from Africa, South America to Europe, all of them say, we began at the center of the earth, right? Now, before I reveal and present my cosmic egg presentation or one of the models tonight, I'd briefly like to explore the nature and anatomy of an egg, right? A normal, everyday, natural egg. Like I said earlier, nature is one of my biggest points of reference for my model and theory. I propose that perhaps, just perhaps, to fully understand the concept of cosmic creation within our universe, we must first explore the concept of creation and life within our natural, everyday reality, right? What if the big questions about the universe are imprinted in the small things of our universe, a microcosm of the macrocosm, right? Now, of course, we all know the egg is the female reproductive element responsible for creating, incubating, and giving life in our everyday natural world. Eggs generally create life. Insects, birds, fish, humans, all life begins in an egg, the egg of a woman. That is not conspiracy theory, that is a fact, right? In humans, Women produce eggs roughly every 28 days in what's known as a menstrual cycle. This egg creation process generally happens in four stages. The menstrual, the follicular, the ovulate, ovulatory, and the luteal stages. This is really important, there's four stages. Even more interesting is the fact that the female human egg is the largest bodily cell and is made up of a nucleus at the center, surrounded by five concentric rings, right? All eggs have five concentric rings within them and a nucleus where life begins, right? Please bear this in mind, okay? So they have four on the inside, the fifth being the shell membrane holding everything together. These layers are added successively as the egg passes down the oviduct. Life in all eggs begins from the nucleus, the center, the heart of the egg. The egg contains within itself all the essentials for the development of life, leaving the sperm of a male, an external force of energy, the role of activating this already perfectly prepared system. Now, is it conceivable that the, ob 
that the observable natural egg reproductive system in humans could be a mirror reflection of the cosmic egg system of our universe. Right? So I'm saying perhaps this egg that, that creates life in our everyday world perhaps is a microcosm of the egg that creates life in the universe. Right? That's my hypothesis. I'm not saying it is fact, again, I'm saying perhaps. Right. Could the egg of a human contain within it the secrets of the universe? Just as the human egg has a nucleus in its center where life begins, perhaps so too does our universe have a nucleus at its center where life began. And just as a human egg is made up of four inner layers and a greater outer layer, the shell, perhaps, so too does our universe also have four concentric inner layers and a greater outer shell. Again, could the four phases of a woman's menstrual cycle be a mirrored reflection of our four times of the day, or the four phases of the moon, or the four seasons of the year? Is this all linked? Is this all coincidence that all these fours are popping up? And these are facts. I'm not making this up, this is factual, right? Perhaps, just like how the female human egg needs an external energy life force, sperm, in order to create life, so too does our cosmic egg universe also need an external energy, an external energy life force, consciousness, spirit, souls, DMT, whatever you want to call it, in order for life to exist within, right? Of course, many will say all this is just conjecture and speculation, and that's fine. Um, however, I must digress to my earlier statement that nature doesn't lie. Nature tells us all the truths that we need to know. Again, take what resonates, ignore what doesn't, okay? Right, surely the secrets of our universe are encoded everywhere around us in the natural world. I'm a firm believer that if we want to know or understand the construct of our entire universe, all we need to do is observe the microcosmic world around us. Water, plants, cells, bacteria, microbes, eggs, etc., etc. So with that in mind, in the next part of my presentation, uh, I want to briefly go through a few creation mythologies uh, from around the world. All right? And uh, I'm going to reveal my first model, if I can have a hand, please for tonight, which is a small model of what I think our geocentric cosmic egg universe could be, this egg that I'm talking about, okay? Some of you will already be familiar with uh, this topic if you've seen some of my videos. If you haven't, that's fine. Um, it'll all kind of come together as I go along today. Um, I'll, I'll briefly explain as I go. So before we begin, perhaps we should first ask the questions. What is mythology? What is mythology? Sorry, can that be zoomed in on the, um, on the screens? Yeah? Oh, no, okay. Right, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the following are the two best descriptions of what mythology, mythology is. Um, myths are symbolic tales of the past that combine cosmogony and cosmology, which is the origin and nature of the universe. Myths may be contained in rituals and may serve to direct social action and values. The words mythology or myth come from the Greek word mythos, which means story or word. A mythic story expresses the relationship of man to the cosmos. It is a combination of superstitious and religious truth, of primitive fears, and universal understanding. Mythic stories must be explored from divergent perspectives, syncretism, from cultural, historical, psychological, creative, and modern perspectives. And so, that is exactly how I'm going to approach this topic. So, let's start with the Vedic culture. So the Vedics are uh, very old Indian 
uh, you know, religion or tribe or peoples. Um, I've started with the uh, Vedic scriptures because they are some of the oldest scriptures in this domain of earth. In fact, most of these scriptures still remain in their original ancient language of Sanskrit, meaning the earliest documented description of our cosmos is in these scriptures. According to the Vedic scriptures, our universe is said to be egg-shaped, known as the Brahmanda, which is derived from two words, Brahm, which means cosmos or expanding, and Anda, which means egg. It is also sometimes referred to as Hira Ngagaba, which literally means golden fetus or golden womb. In summary, the Vedic creation story goes, in the beginning there was nothing, then the primal egg was created. This cosmic egg is said to have floated around in the emptiness for a while before it broke open into two halves. One half was silver and became the earth, Prithvi, and the other half was golden and became the heavens, Dayas. The area between the two shells became the mid-region, space known as Bhuva. The scriptures go on to describe how the earth is in the middle or center of this cosmic egg, also known as the Bumanda, Bumandala earthly plane. Okay? This Bumandala earthly plane is said to have various concentric rings of lands, oceans, mountains expanding across a vast expanse. And this vast earthly Bumandala plane is said to be billions of miles across. This is according to the scriptures. Okay? At the center of the earthly plane is a central realm where the sacred Mount Meru is located, surrounded by four islands, Jambudvipa, Uttarakuru, Ketmala, and Badrasava, okay? which you'll see in the models when you get a bit closer. Obviously, there are hundreds and hundreds of pages that go on to describe the creation story in much more detail, which I really encourage you to research in your own time, because the Vedics go into so much detail. They give figures, numbers, um, it's just unbelievable. Um, it's just interesting. Another popular creation story is the one told in another ancient scripture, the Hebrew and Judaic Bible. The Old Testament of the Bible opens with a magnificently confident statement. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth by separating the waters above and the waters below. All right? Of course, we all know the classical biblical creation story that takes place over six days or seven days, so I won't repeat it. However, what is more interesting is the description of the Garden of Eden, where life is said to have begun, right? This garden was at the center of the world, according to the Bible, right? And just like in Vedic scriptures, the Bible describes the Garden of Eden as having a tree in its center, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So those are two cultures, the Indians and the Bible, both agreeing on, on the same thing, right? This garden itself is said to be separated by four rivers, the Tigris, the Pishon, the Gihon, and the Euphrates. Of course, in this world central four island, four river paradise, with a central pillar in the middle, seems to be a recurring theme, not just in these religious texts, but in mythologies across the board, and also in maps cartographed as recent as the 16th, 17th, and even 18th uh, century. I'm sure many of you here will be familiar with some of these maps circulating on the internet. Right, let's move over to the Greeks, right? Greek, ancient Greeks. The Orphic Egg. Right. In ancient Greece, they had a religion known as Orphism. This Orphic religion was based on the idea that all life in the universe began in a silver egg, the Orphic Egg. This cosmic egg is often depicted with a serpent coiled around it, right? The story describes how a garden or golden-winged deity, god named Fanes, was hatched from this egg. And Fanes then created all the other gods in our universe. Another Greek interpretation is the Greek Palestinian creation myth. Even today, there still lives a famous Palestinian poem uh, in Greece, describing the creation of our universe, which goes as follows. And I quote, The goddess of all things arose naked from chaos 
to part sea from sky so she could dance upon the waves, catching the north wind on her back and rubbing it between her hands. She warms the pneuma and spontaneously generates the serpent Orphean, who mates with her in the form of a dove upon the waters. She lays the cosmic egg and bids Orphean to incubate it by coiling seven times around it until it splits in two and hatches all things that exist. Sun, moon, planets, stars, the earth, with its mountains, rivers, its trees, herbs, and living creatures. So again, we see this number seven, seven days of creation, seven coils around this cosmic egg, seven wandering planets. Um, you know, you're seeing this synchronicity coming together, right? Numbers. I'd also just like to add that when I came across this serpent thing, it was a bit uh, worrying. I thought, why am I seeing these serpents? You'll see a lot of this serpent mythology or symbolism. And I thought, why, why serpents? Why snakes? What is this? This is, uh, what does this mean? So I did a bit of research and it turns out that a lot of ancient cultures, when you see a snake, it's often depicting energy. Snakes are always talking about energy in ancient cosmology. So bear that in mind and it will make sense as I go along. So when you think about this cosmic egg with the serpent coiled around it, right, the universe is coiled around by energy, electromagnetic energy. That's what that serpent is, right? So it's not some evil snake in the skies eating people. It's just uh, energy, okay? Right. Um, Right. In this Greek mythological scenario, the coiled serpent is no doubt alluding, as I've said, to the electromagnetic torus field of our universe. I'll further elaborate as we go along. It's also interesting to note that just like the Vedics and Bible, the Greeks also describe the center of the earth, the North Pole, as the cradle of humanity. They call this place Hyperborea, which translates to place beyond the north wind. I think that's quite self-explanatory, okay? So they said life began at the center of the earth in a place called Hyperborea. Next, let's look at the Chinese and Japanese. What did they say about creation? In China, there are various creation myths, most of them revolving around the cosmic egg concept, complemented by the yin and yang philosophy. But perhaps the most popular Chinese creation myth revolves around the story of Pangu, the story goes, before the world came into being, there existed only the cosmic egg that floated unchanging in the void for untold ages. This cosmic egg was perfectly balanced, yin and yang, opposites peacefully existing, undisturbed within the chaos of the void. And from this egg, Pangu, or God, came to be. Okay? Pangu then began to fashion the material of chaos into order, separating yin and yang um, into sky and earth, light and dark, up and down, etc., etc., duality. In modern terms, we might call this the beginning of space, time, and matter. Anyway, Pangu is then said to have been aided by the four creatures who had emerged from this egg with him, the unicorn, the dragon, the phoenix, and the tortoise, which I think are the four elements, earth, air, wind, and water. Eventually, Pangu dies, and his various body parts become all the physical elements of our universe. However, upon Pangu's death, his breath is said to have entered everything that lives within the universe, thereby creating something called Tien Tsun, the first cause of consciousness. So they're saying everything that is conscious has the breath of God within them. That's what the Chinese believe, or believed. Now, of course, this is just a summary. The story goes into far more detail. If you're interested, please go off and research this for yourselves. In Japan, however, the story begins with the contents of a cracked egg floating like a jellyfish through the void of the primordial waters. From the substance of this cracked egg, many gods were created, the most important two being Izinagi, the male, and Izinami, the female. Right, again, that yin and yang. Together they split the waters 
and standing on the floating bridge of the heavens above the waters, they leaned down to stir the brine of the sea below them with the lance. The liquid began to curdle and formed an island beneath them. This island, according to the Japanese, is the, ori is the origin of the human race. Its name was Ono Gorojima, the island of the congealed drop or the folded valley. Okay? So they say when life began, it's a congealed drop, a folded valley of some kind at the center of everything. Ono Gorojima is said to be the center of the earth. The two gods, Izanagi and Izanami, who created this island, are said to have come down onto it and built a central pillar in the middle of it. And from there, they created all the other earthly islands and gods to inhabit their new world or universe. Once again, there's that recurring theme of a central pillar at the center of the world where life began. I also like, I particularly like the Japanese description of this central realm as a congealed drop of folded valley. This is very significant, um, as I'll show in my model. Okay. Next, let's look a little bit closer to where we are, the Celtics. Okay. Right? The Celtic Druids perceived the cosmos or universe as a world tree with three worlds inhabited by various gods and goddesses. The three worlds within this world tree, the middle world, which is earth, the upper worlds, the heavens, and the underworlds below the earth. The middle world, or earth, was said to contain four islands with the sacred fifth at its center, right? This central world symbolized the core or heart of the earth. The upper worlds beyond our realm were known as Gwynfeed, and the lower worlds or the underworlds below the earth were known as Abred or Anwen. Sorry for my pronunciation, any Welsh people? Uh, Martin Lidke. <laughs> the space of void surrounding this cosmic tree was known as Kiwijant. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. The myth goes on to describe how when all realms are in harmonious balance, the three worlds, the upper, middle and under, connect straight down through the center with the energy of something called Nwaifer, okay? Nwaifer's bright energy is said to be a scepter of light that goes straight down and up through the center of the world tree surrounding the entire cosmology of our universe. The earthly middle world was said to be more connected to the upper worlds, the heavens, than the underworlds. Okay? The underworlds were said to usually be located through the sea or places that reach deep water. Okay? Again, you can see this parallel on the model when you get a bit closer. Still in Europe, Europe let's visit the Norse or Scandinavians. What do they believe? In Norse mythology, Odin or God is said to have willed himself into being out from the womb or egg of the Gunungap, the void that existed. The Norse also described our universe as being part of a tree yet again. Much like the Celtics, this tree is said to also be divided into three. Asgard being the heavens, Midgard being the earth, and Helen being the underworld. Again, like the Celtics, the Norse believed there is a bridge of light that runs through the center of our universe, right top to bottom, connecting all three worlds. This central pillar was known as the Bright Frost Bridge. Another interesting observation of the Norse mythology is the story of Ostara. Uh, sorry again for the pronunciation for any Nordics in here. Also known as Oistra or Estre, who was the goddess of springtime, fertility, creation, rebirth, life. Perhaps this is where we get the modern concept of Easter eggs at springtime. We're celebrating life, birth, right? Why eggs? Interesting. Next up, not far from the Norse, we have the Finns or the Finnish, right? Their story begins with a god named Vianna Monen, god of the primordial emptiness. Vianna Monen is said to have created the universe from the egg of an eagle. In a nutshell, 
Vianamonen breaks this egg into many pieces and creates the universe from all these pieces. The story goes on to describe how, in the old days, the lands of the peoples of Earth, of early Earth, was surrounded by waters. Above the land arched the mighty vault of the skies, which was held up by a cosmic tree located, excuse me, once again at the center of the world, yet again. This center column was attached to the pole star around which the universe rotated. The pole star was also regarded as a kind of heavenly hinge known as the Nort Pin. Okay? Directly below the Nort Pin was said to be the lands of the living. This is really important. Okay? I'm going to read this again. Directly below the North Pin was said to be the lands of the living. Right? Those right below the North Star. Surrounded by a stream, Tuone Lanverta, the stream of Tuenela. This stream was regarded as the border between the living on the inside and the dead on the outside. So they considered those living on the outside of this central realm as the living dead, whatever reasons. And everyone who was in there was living, whatever that means. Okay. The dead on the outside wishing to join the living on the inside had to cross this stream in the far north into a village called Pohola. So they said this central world, there is a village called Pohola. And this village is at the intersection of the sky and earth, where the sky and earth meet. Right? What do they mean by that? This village is where the sky and earth meet. Again, when you talk about that crater continent or that valley, if it's a crater and there are clouds above it, if you imagine standing on the edge of this valley or this crater, you'd think you're where the skies and the earth meet. That's what I think. Again, it will make sense when you get a bit closer to the, uh, to the big model. Okay. Now, according to the Finns, before reaching Pohola, um, the dead seeking life would first need to defeat a no man's land, the land of Lintu Kotolinen, home of the birds. Now, this is interesting because considering it is well-known fact that even today many birds right during winter are said to fly north right they fly north where are they flying where are they going when these birds go north right perhaps they are flying to this northern no man's land of Linto Kolinen, right home of the birds described by these ancient Finnish right Perhaps, with so much detail, you can see why this Finnish cosmology is certainly one of my favorites. You know, their description of the central place is so vivid. Um, it brought my model to life. It put a lot of pieces together for me. So, we've briefly explored Vedic, Indian scriptures, the Bible, Greek, Chinese, Japanese, Celtic, Norse, and Finnish mythology. And I'm sure you can see the various obvious similarities in all their creation stories and description of our universe. Is this a coincidence? Perhaps. For now, let's continue. Next, let's get out of Europe and head to the Middle East, ancient Persia in particular. In ancient Persia, they had a religion known as Zoroastrianism. I can I can never say this. Zoroastrianism, also known as Mazda Yajna. This is said to be one of the oldest religions in the world, in the known world, originating in the Iranian Persian re region about 3,000 years ago, and is still practiced even today in that region of the earth. Zoroastrianism is also said to have been the dominant religion in parts of India, Persia, and most of Middle Eastern regions prior to the birth of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So this is the mother of those three religions, according to researchers. So it's a very old religion. The most important teachings of this religion are found in scriptures known as the Avestas. According to these texts, in the beginning, Ormad, or Mazda, the creator, dwelt on high in pure light. And Arman, or Angra, the destroyer, dwelt in the depths of darkness, similar to the yin and yang principle, or 
you know, the uh, God and devil principle. Between them was the void. The two opposing gods then battled for control of the universe, eventually resulting in a truce that led to co-creation between them. This cosmic creation saga unfolded, yet again, in seven stages, according to the investors. First was the creation of the skies, Vairia, which was said to have enclosed the world like the shell of an egg. The second creation was water, Hawar Vatat, which filled the lower half of the egg. The third creation was the earth, Armaiti, shaped like a disc floating on the primeval waters. And on the earth stood the fourth, fifth, and sixth creations, which are all things that dwelt upon, above, and within the earth. And finally, the seventh creation was fire, or spirit, Arda Wahist, which gave life to all of God's creation, the breath of God. All of this was said to be protected by the great tree of life at the center, once again. And this tree of life was said to have been protected by Amur Dad, the first man, who was made in God's very own image. Okay, you can see the similarities uh, with the Bible and Quran straight away. Okay, still in the Middle East, we move to Syria, which is a very hot topic at the moment. Okay, the Assyrian creation myth. The ancient Assyrians were very closely related to the Zoroastrians. In their mythology, it was a fish which pushed ashore from the river Euphrates, an egg containing their goddess, Atagatis, and from it, she was hatched. Atagatis was considered the divine feminine great mother and fertility goddess of the three worlds, the heavens, the earth, and the waters. And of course, the story goes into much uh, more, uh, it's, it's much more broader than that, but I won't get into it. Um, please research it in your own time. What about the ancient Americas? What did they say about the creation and construct of our universe? Let's move to North America, the Zuni tribe. The Zuni tribe are peoples native to the Zuni River Valley of North America. It was in what, was used, in what used to be Apache native land, what is today the state of New Mexico in the United States. According to the Zuni creation myth, in the beginning was nothing but the great space of ages, complete void of darkness and emptiness. And in this void, only God, Awa Noa Lona, existed in peace. One day, Awa Noa Lona, through thought alone, contained himself in the form of a great sun. And within this sun form, he came to be the brightness that lit the void of the world. Awa Noa Lona then formed the seed that created the two worlds of our universe the heavens above us, and the earth we are stood on. The earth was known as Awi Telin Tsita, or, this is very important, the four-wombed Mother Earth. So they said Mother Earth had four wombs, right? Which we'll cover in a bit. And the heavens became Apoyan Tachu, the all-covering Father Sky. Now the four wombs of Mother Earth, I think, are referencing the four worlds or districts on, uh, on my model, which again, I'll go into a bit more detail uh, when I describe the, the larger model. Right, anyway, together, heaven and earth, with the help of the life-giving waters, created terrestrial life on earth. And this terrestrial life began in the fourth world at the center, the middle, of the world and it began moving outwards towards the outer world or wombs of mother earth i think that's quite self-explanatory in the zuni narrative the fourth world is said to be hidden underground again that folded valley or that drop right they say this central world is somewhere underground according to the zuni people began long ago in this underground fourth world near the center of the world. Once again, we can see the Zuni might have interpreted, like I said, 
This syncretizes again with the um, congealed drop with the Japanese. Over time, with the help from the deities, the priests learned the ability to create prayer sticks from the magical wood, wood that grew in this fourth world. They used these prayer sticks to climb from the fourth world up into the third world, the second and the first. So they said at some point when we were created, human beings created some sort of technology to leave this fourth world and enter the outer world. They, okay. To this day, the Zuni describe the great mother earth as having four womb, wombs or worlds with an additional fifth sacred womb, the daylight world at the center. They also still call the origin or, the, or their original homeland Holana Idiwana to this day which translates to the middle place. So the ancient Zuni tribes, if you ask them, where are your origins, they'll say we came from the middle place, right? Of course, there are other Native American tribes with similar narratives, like the Coahuila of California, the Omaha of Nebraska, etc., etc. Right, but my personal favorite Native American description of our universe is from a tribe further down in South America, the Kogi native Indian tribe, okay? The Kogi or Kogui or the Kagaba, meaning Jaguar in the Kogi language, are an indigenous ethnic group that still lives in the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta region of Colombia. Did I say that correctly? <laughs> yeah. Their civilization has survived and thrived since before the pre-Columbian era. The central figure in their religion is something called Logo, who is the universal mother goddess, also known as the supreme creator of all that exists. This mother goddess, the first creation, is said to have been the cosmic egg. So that is the first thing she created, was a cosmic egg. And this cosmic egg was conceived as a divine uterus, also known as the womb of the great mother goddess. According to the Kogi, our egg-shaped universe has nine layered realms within it. And mankind occupies the middle of those realms, in the middle of this egg, leaving four realms above and four realms below. The four upper layers are called the Nui Nalang, or the four worlds of the sun. Again, four worlds of the sun, right? above the earth. Okay, again. Right, anyway, moving on. The Kogi believe that everything in the universe is connected, a never-ending reflection of itself. We might call this a microcosm of the macrocosm in modern scientific terms, as I alluded to earlier on. This concept is demonstrated with how they build their ceremonial houses, even today, right? If you go to these tribes, they still have these houses. They build their sacred houses in the center, thank you, in the center of their village. So they build a village and in the center, they build their church or their ceremonial house. Each house is circular and has four circular stepped wooden shelves on the inside, finished with a dome conical roof to reflect the shape of our universal cosmic egg. Inside, uh, Inside this circular concentric stepped building in the very center is said to be the most important and holy place. Okay? This is where the ceremonial priests of the village address the gods from. So when they're praying, they walk into this hut and they all sit bang in the middle underneath the center and they say, this is where we pray from. So I think that's symbolical. Okay? To this day, the Kogi believe that the center of our world is a sacred place of perfect balance known as Anun. This is where life began and the gods still reside to this day. So now, we've been to ancient Asia, we've been to Europe, we've been to the Middle East. And as you can see, all these ancient uh, cultures 
are singing from the same verse when describing the creation and construction of our universe. They're all saying the same thing. Again, is this coincidence? Did they just happen to guess the same thing? You know, were there, was there a conspiracy with these ancient cultures, right, to, to deceive future people? Or did they know something that we've lost to today? Right? Let's move on. Now, of course, having been incarnated in Africa, I'm African this time round, naturally, I was keen to learn what, if any, African tribes, past and present, had to say about the creation and construct of our universe. I'll start with the famous ancient Kemetic Egyptians, of course. The ancient Egyptians had a few creation versions of a similar story, mainly divided by three religions, the Hermopolitan, the Heliopolitan, and the Mephite theologies. Despite a few differences, all three told a very similar creation story, often centered around eight Ogdod gods, so eight gods of creation. The Ogdod were the celestial rulers of the cosmos, said to have been born out of a cosmic egg. Okay? The Ogdod were the celestial rulers of the cosmos, said to have been born... I've read that already. <laughs> and the cosmic egg itself was said to have been laid by a celestial goose called the Gengen Ware. Okay? Sometimes referred to as the Ibis bird, known as Toth or Thought. Right? Toth translates to Thought. So thought created this cosmic egg, according to the uh, Kemetic Egyptians. Now, not only was Toth responsible for creating the cosmic egg, but he was also responsible for creating sound, writing, hieroglyphics, language, and all things associated with wisdom. Another version of the ancient Egyptian creation story is one centered around the deity Atum. Okay? This version describes how our universe evolved from the body of a god called Atum, who existed in the primordial sea of nothingness. Through thought, or Toth, Atum united his own feminine energy and manifested Shu, god of the air, and Tefnut, goddess of water. Tefnut and Shu then united to create earth and sky, known as Geb and Nut. Geb and Nut then united, creating the eight Ogdod gods. And these gods in turn created or gave birth to everything else in our universe. Another one of my favorites is a modern tribe of people in Africa, um, closely related to the ancient Egyptians, known as the Dogons. Okay? Today, there are about 100,000 members of this tribe. They have isolated themselves topographically and culturally from the outside world for countless centuries. So they've not mixed much with the outside world. They've tried to keep their culture as intact as possible. So this is a fantastic reference because this is mythology that is living. You can go there today and speak to them and they'll tell you what I'm about to tell you. Okay? Right. And so, uh, like oh, the, dog, the Dogon, are said to be direct descendants of the ancient great Egyptian empire. In fact, Dogon cosmology is said to be the exact cosmology of the ancient Kemetic Anu priesthood. Okay? According to the Dogon, the universe started with Ama, the creator. Ama, Ama, yes. Ama is the Dogon name for Amen or Amun Ra. Okay, this is where we get the word Amen from from Amma, the great mother, in Egyptian mythos. She is described as the intelligent consciousness behind all of creation and the awareness within all beings. Amma is often described as she who rests upon nothing and she who knows everything. Okay? To the Dogon, the universe is considered Amma's egg. The story goes on to describe how, in the beginning, Amma was alone and divided into four parts, earth, air, fire, and water. She then created Ogo, her first creation, who was in the form of an amphibious serpent, that snake thing again, also known as Apep in Kemetic Egypt, 
Okay, energy. Serpent, of course, symbolizing energy. Orgo then helped Ama create the universe. However, Orgo soon revolted against Ama. Okay, the serpent, uh, the uh, the energy revolted against Ama, the great mother. And the ensuing struggle between the two is what created the dualistic nature of our existence. Again, we see that yin and yang concept. Amma then placed seven words, again, seven words, into the universal seed of life known as the poor. The number seven, once again. The poor began to vibrate strongly from within, vibration. The spiraling vibrations caused four clevises to grow forth from the center of the universe. And from this center, all that exists in our universe sprouted from. To this day, the Dogon believe that they, that they come from the Sirius star system directly below the North Pole. Right, my last one today is the Yorubo or Yoruba, sorry, Igbo, Fawn, and Akan um, of West Africa. What did they say? Okay, so this is the last one before I, I move on. Right, um, these tribes have a similar creation story with slight variations. Their creation story explains how before the beginning of everything, there was only Ashe, the creative force itself. Ashe alone and peaceful one day began to think. And when thinking began, Ashe created the first god, Olo Dumare, using only thought yet again. Olo Dumare then created his first creation, Olorun, the heavens, soon after followed by Olofi, the earth. Olorun and Olofi are said to have lived in the adobe, or center of everything that exists. Together, Olorun and Olofi, heaven and earth, combined their thoughts to create the goddess Nana, right? The grandmother of all living divinities. Nana herself begins to think. Again, we use this word Nana for grandmother, even in, in Western cultures, I think. Nana herself begins to think. Her first thought uh, gave birth to Mawa, the giant cosmic egg that sat in the stillness of the adobe, or universe. Her second thought created Lisa, the seed of life, which fertilizes the egg from within the center, like we said earlier on. Now these three goddesses, now Nana, Mawa, and Lisa, are referred to as the first great divinities of our universe. Okay? Together, they created Oshumare, the rainbow serpent, who is responsible for binding and keeping Mawa, the cosmic egg, together by coiling himself around it. Right? So this snake coiled himself around the cosmic egg to, to keep it together, to bind it. Okay? This energy. Right? It's also interesting that the Fawn people of Benin believe that this serpent, Oshumare, 